All right. Welcome to our seventh podcast of Renew Your Mind. Back with us today is Pastor Paul Grunenberg, our senior pastor at the uh, Gaylord Methodist Church. And we have Jordan Chambers, our youth and family pastor, and Dana Hall, myself, as, as the moderator. So at the ending of our last podcast, we ended with um, Jordan telling us a little bit about his moment of salvation. And I had a question um, I didn't get a chance to ask, and I wanted to ask him um, how old he was when he had that moment. Yeah, so that was, again, it was my birthday. It was my, I believe it was my sixth birthday. It was either my fifth or sixth. It was in the 1990s, probably around 95, 96. Um, and so it would have been really in our first year that my dad was at that specific church. Mm-hmm. It was his second church that he was in because, uh, of course, he was a pastor as well. And so we had not been at that church for very long, but just a little bit less than a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'd still built up such an easy camaraderie. And I said, the people there mm-hmm. were just, just awesome about supporting that that kind of thing. It That's was, really neat. Yeah, it was really yeah cool. we were discussing how we had those moments all at different points of our life. So um, uh, we're going to go back to Pastor Paul now, and we're up to his college days. And um, we were curious. Uh, we wanted to know where you went to college and what degree did you get? So I went to after high school in Saginaw, I went to Central Michigan University. And at Central Michigan, I began to meet some people, you know, just good guys. And we had a lot of fun together. The spiritual aspect of it was pretty much at that point, I won't say non-existent. Uh, We went or continued to go to church after my dad died with my mom and did that faithfully through college or through high school. And then in college, of course, like every kid, you find freedom from having to do what your parents want or, you know, having any, what's the word? Um, Accountability. Yeah, accountability <laughs> yeah. to anyone about what you were going to do. So Sunday mornings, uh, pretty much either slept in or just went to the uh, hall where I usually had my meals. I lived off campus but had a food card because it was it just made sense to eat over there. <laughs> and so Sunday was just another day. It was a day that I didn't have classes. I would try to get some work done. Mm-hmm. But there's that aspect of God pursuing you. Mm -hmm. It's a Wesleyan understanding of the Holy Spirit wooing you to God. And in that understanding, as I look back in my college years, there were several people whom God used to keep me connected with God. Mm -hmm. During the summers, I worked at summer camps, which happened to be Lutheran. Uh, The first two summers in college, I was a camp counselor, and they had a seminary Mm -hmm. guy do the pastoral stuff and Bible stuff, and I think I can count on one time in those two years that I went and actually participated in the, I don't remember what it was called, but we'll call it the the Bible aspect of camp, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. or pastors would come and bring their confirmands and spend time in the morning mm-hmm. for a couple hours. And for me, that was free time. Mm-hmm. Do laundry, do other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was a connection there because some of the other counselors seemed to have that connection with God. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until the second camp that I worked at where some of the counselors were actually school uh, or college kids from Central that I really began to... Um, or I guess I should say, where God had an opportunity to reach into my life through these people. And in doing so, these some of these kids were much more spiritually attuned. And I could sense that, but I really, I wouldn't say I resisted it as a thought, but it just wasn't where I was at. Wasn't attractive either. There was a piece that some of them had. One of the mm. uh other students. She was, uh, I think, a year older. Her dad died, and she just had a piece about her as she went about life. 
And, you know, I really appreciated Mary because Mary had some other qualities that God used. She was a great listener. And there were, I can remember a time or two where I could just call Mary up and say, Mary, I've got some things I just need to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have time for me? And she would make time for me. Mm -hmm. And that was important. And I remember one really critical moment in college. And the person I, I mean, I was emotionally uh, a wreck, a wreck. I was at a critical point emotionally with Mm. some other people that I knew. And I called up the pastor of the church. And actually, I actually rode my bike over to his house. Once I found out where it was, his wife (laughs) said, he's out right now. Uh, Can I leave a message? I said, no, I'll come back. And I went riding for another half an hour, 45 minutes, came back and he was there. And I just like, man, poured out my heart to him. Mm -hmm. And and Mm -hmm. there was there was a safety uh, to me. Maybe it was from growing up. It was the routine of being in church uh, where I knew that this was the guy I needed to talk to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he really helped me through it. I mean, he listened to me, and then he just asked a couple questions. And that's what I needed at that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I believe God was continuing to stay in touch with me through these people. There was a friend of mine who was gaining the same degree I was, and he lived in his house, which was distinctly Christian. Mm -hmm. And we became friends, and and God would use him later uh, after college to help me make a transition toward God. Mm -hmm. Were both of those camps um, inside the state of Michigan, or were they? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, One was way up north in Mayo. Uh Uh-huh. The other one was in <laughs> way up north, huh? Miles was way up north, north yeah. in West Branch, which is oh. actually down <laughs> south from here. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's funny. Okay, um, it's interesting you say that. I too was a uh, camp counselor for two years, mm-hmm. and uh, in Houghton Lake at a camp in there. It's a camp called Kobiak, and uh, it was it was the camp that my dad received his salvation experience at. Actually, when oh, cool. he was a young man. It was kind of cool just to have that tradition about it, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Back when he was there, they had speakers like Warren Wiersbe and some other theological thinkers like that. But um, when I was there, there was a very strong emphasis on spiritual development. And, you know, the the counselors were expected probably more so than the kids Mm. to develop their, you know, their spirituality. And um, I was in charge of, we divided all the counselors up by color. So there was a blue team, the red team, you know, the competitive spirit. And the blue team was my team for two years. And so I was in charge of leading them in their spiritual development, the counselors. Mm -hmm. And then we would have our cabins as well. And that was a growing time for me as Mm -hmm. well. Um, My wife also worked at the camp for one of those years. So that was kind of handy to have. You know, a little bit of extra time. <laughs> we were both lifeguards, so, you know, going to the beach together was great. But, um, is that how you met your wife? It is not. I met my not. wife in college, okay. on, right. really on a blind date. It's kind of a longer story, but her sister asked, and she has several sisters that look quite similar, at least in college they did. And so I really wasn't a hundred percent sure which sister was <laughs> was being. I asked hope out. you didn't. But I tell said, her "Oh, that. sure, why not? I'll go." But we we hit it off pretty easily, pretty quick, and um, yeah, things flourished pretty well from there. So many similarities. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's uh, overwhelming. Um, so I guess question for either one of you. Um, I'll give this to Pastor Paul first, but maybe mm-hmm. Jordan, you want to jump in. Um, you talk about touch points in which God get your attention. Um, do you think this is normal for God and people in general or more specific just to either one of you? Or what are your thoughts about that? I think God is always trying to get our attention. And Jordan shares a, a camp story. I remember the second camp I worked at, the director said on those weeks where it's not a pastor bringing the kids for confirmation camp. I want you to teach a Bible study. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, and I'm thinking, now look at you're the son of a, 
pastor, you think you should be able to do this. And right. he gave us a book to follow. And I would take a blanket out with my Bible, my confirmation Bible, actually. I think it was younger than confirmation. Uh, but I would take it uh, with the kids and we'd find a spot and we'd sit down and I tried to get these kids to listen. And I'm thinking, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and, and you say that I always had a, I guess I've always had a sense of the presence of God, but I always haven't necessarily had an ongoing relationship. Mm -hmm. This would be like uh, being in the same college class. You could know someone by recognizing them, but you wouldn't know their name. Mm -hmm. Only in this case, I know who the Lord was, and I could recognize when the Lord was reaching out to me or speaking to me, but it wasn't that I intentionally wanted to build a relationship with that person. Mm -hmm. So it would be just more come and go. Um, yeah, I see you there. And, and a lot of this is just reflecting back. Mm -hmm. And I think if we all reflected back, we could see those touch points where God was trying to, you know, get our attention. Hey, Dana. Hey, mm -hmm. Jordan. Mm -hmm. Hey, Paul. I'm still here, and I want a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. What about you, Pastor Jordan? I do. Um, I do believe that God reaches out and 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 seeks after every person. I think that's one of the most basic biblical truths there is that God mm -hmm. wants everyone included in his kingdom. And um, I think God in his love uses every capable tool without sacrificing our ability to choose, um, uses every capable tool in his belt to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, leaves it up to us in the end whether we'll use that that choice or not. Um, I do think, too, that the, I, I remember when I was in college and I was... Um, I was a history major initially because I was thinking about going into politics. I wanted to be a lobbyist. I was I had these plans kind of preset, which was a little bit abnormal because I'm not really a planning kind of guy, you know. But there was some specific things I thought I wanted to do, and then I woke up one morning. It was in my second year of college, and um, I I can't really say there was a vision or a dream, but I woke up one day with this massive urge to do ministry. And it was out of the blue, kind of mm -hmm. out of nowhere. It just I don't know how or why, but it happened, you know. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this real strong passion for ministry, especially with younger people. And that's when I got involved in a a program to mentor youth that were on a juvenile camp at a naval base down there in Pensacola. Um, and immediately started plugging myself in, changed my major over to pastoral ministries. Mm. I decided to commit to that. And uh, that kind of led me on the path, but it was just, just a strong, like I said, it's hard to describe, but it, I can definitely define the fact that it was there. And uh, I think that God pushes hard on us sometimes and uses different ways and things to do it. It is still up to us, though. You know, even in mm -hmm. the Bible, there's quite a few examples where God presses on. I'm thinking of Jonah. Mm -hmm. You know, God presses hard on Jonah over and over supernatural event after supernatural event and Jonah still is saying maybe yeah I don't <laughs> think so you know and then when he finally does and all these people do repent he's all mad about it like oh, it's not supposed to happen I wanted to see people roasted by God's fury you know <laughs> you know our choices they they matter and God makes sure of that but at the same time it, it's God is constantly at work in our lives mm -hmm. and I know that from my experience and from my life, and I, I can definitely say, you know, as I shared with my, my salvation, there were people that just were significant about helping that to mm -hmm. happen. In the end, I did make a choice, but there were so many people involved, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. directly and indirectly, that um, it reminds you of the value of being involved in church and being involved in your faith mm -hmm. because souls, that's how they're transformed. Mm-hmm. Mr. Yeah. Martinson was my Sunday school teacher in third grade. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Abeth was the first time I heard a sermon, I think probably around 14 or 15, where I felt God was really speaking to me. So I can name some of those people yeah. that you're talking about and how important it is for you to live out your 
uh, faith in Christ in a way that is not private, Mm -hmm. but is more visible. And that's scary to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I remember times when pff, I wasn't going to say a word about being a Christian or if somebody was railing against something of God, I wouldn't be the person to stand up and say, but have you thought of this? Mm-hmm. And I think that comes with maturity. I think mm-hmm. that comes with confidence in what God is going to do in and through you. I think when I look back at those moments, I was thinking, what can I do mm-hmm. as opposed to what could, what can God do through me? So, I mean, Jordan, what's the name of a couple of people that had that kind of significance in your life? Well, I would first off probably say my parents, especially my mom. Uh, like I said, she, she read Scripture with us every single day, mm-hmm. every single day. And she was the one that led me to Christ initially in that moment. And I can say under my dad's preaching, I I went to the altar quite a bit. You know, <laughs> I can also say though, I remember a gentleman named Chuck, um, who one awesome experience we had growing up in Baptist church. The altar is always available, and you saw people always going for it. Sometimes every single week, the same person. You know, you know. <laughs> but I remember going to the altar a handful of times, and um, this man named Chuck would come up. If he saw me go and he, he would look out for certain people, he would come up behind and just go to the altar with you and he would kneel and pray with you. And just, he would ask, is there anything I can pray for right here, right now? And if he said, I, I, I'm not ready to tell you, he said, well, I'm just going to pray for you this way. And then he'd pray. Mm-hmm. I mean, amazing support. And it was personal. He didn't have to know the details, mm-hmm. but just just builds you up and you know encourages you and and if there's something you got to get right it helps you to do that you know mm-hmm. uh so I, I would definitely say my parents i would say chuck i would definitely say um there have been certain people in college that i had some discussions with um i think I think of a guy named nick and uh some others that i had just these real uh, thought-provoking questions about what Scripture was really saying. And especially I remember one day talking with a guy named Nick, uh, who was another pastor and ministries major, about Romans 14. Changed my life mm-hmm. reading that, that chapter about uh, how certain people do some things to the glory of God, other people do the exact opposite, but for the glory of God. And it is about you determining your life will be about the glory of God more than any other thing like I said, radically changed my life. I no longer felt like it was important for me to tell people the rules. Mm -hmm. It was way more important for me to tell them the value of worshiping and living for God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can say certain people, especially but through certain times, had these transforming events that, you know, I've just been able to look back on and use as landmarks, you know, throughout the, the life that I've had. Now, Dana, you're the moderator, but I'm sure there's a name or two in there for you. Yeah, and all my occurrences help, you know, they happened later in life, you know, Mm -hmm. later than both of you. Um, But, yeah, actually, you know, Pat and Carol Scott and Pat's father, you know, he would come up to every one of us and give us a little book, a little Bible, and Mm -hmm. tell us that God loved us. He'd pick up the phone and call you and just see how you're doing. So there's a lot of... A lot of other people like that, but those are the first couple that come to my mind. So, yeah. And what's interesting is that, as you say that, they weren't saying anything outlandish, or no, I've they... used the term in a couple of sermons now, fanatical, mm-hmm. or like Bible thumpers or something like that, about living your life for Christ is about, you know, we call it being a good person. Yeah but being able to have a reason for being a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, what makes you so good? Well, you know, I want to serve God. That's a simple answer that's not threatening anyone, Mm. but it raises up the flagpole of your life. Look at, I'm here to serve God. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's got to be really powerful for someone to hear. Very powerful, especially when you realize that and you're like, wow. And when you look Takes back away. Yeah. on those things, I know in my life this is true, and I would assume that this is true for both of you as well. But when you look back on those times and events and you think of the words that were being said, so often it was very simple. Oh, yes. And mm-hmm. it, was, it did not take much effort. It did not take – all it took was a little bit of willingness and forethought. 
That's mm-hmm. all it took was just someone said, you know, that person looks like they could use an arm. I think I'll go offer it and say, can I pray for you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and that does wonders. Like I said, lifelong, I still remember those events. I still remember those people because mm-hmm. that's how formative and effective they were. And, and they weren't afraid to do it. Right. And the thing yeah. is, anyone can do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Anyone can do it. And everyone that's should true. do that if we're on. And Dana, you said, how did you just phrase that? Anyone can do it. It was... Um, I forgot what they're, I said. <laughs> they're, really, they're really good about doing it. and yet, Oh, they're not afraid to do it. Yeah. But the truth is there is a point at some time in their life where they are afraid to do it. Well, great. And they yeah. just need to take, they need to push through that fear because fear does yeah. not come from God. At least that kind of fear does not come from God. That's, that's the evil one wanting to keep you from advancing your ministry for God. Mm-hmm. And so when we push through that fear, which is so important, we receive untold blessings yeah. because we have reached out and have helped someone else. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, let's, uh, let's pause for a moment on, uh, uh, after you mentioned that thought. So um, Jordan, can you tell us um, about the virtual vacation Bible school that's going to come up, and then we'll take a break. Yes, yeah, so we're we're pretty excited. I know we've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again: um, Facebook, YouTube, and the website. Those are the three places you're going to be able to get this. It's August 24th through the 28th, and they're going to be an hour long, but there'll be a ton of fun. So you need to check those out. If you, your children, your grandchildren, or your cousins of your uncle twice removed, whoever is going to be there watching these videos. We want them to get craft kits. We want them to be involved. So please contact the church and be looking for announcements as we'll be uh, sending those your way through our Facebook and, and other mediums as well. Yeah, and that sounds great. And you can either come to the church to pick those up or we can bring them to you. Um, if you have a, a, a something laid upon your heart that you want to come visit our church in person, um, we have a traditional service at 9 a.m., and a contemporary at 10.45 a.m., and we are located on 215 South Center Street. All right, well, let's wrap it up, and um, we are going to uh, get into adulthood on our next segment. Thanks, everyone.